Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Howard Yermish, John Atwood, and Pat. Coming up on DTNS, Amazon's healthcare goals continue. How Google and Meta plan to deal with news. And what is Sonos up to hardware-wise? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 25th, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. From Austin, Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, we've got all sorts of stuff to talk about today, including speakers that may or may not work for you, and many, many other things. But first, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Twitter's former security chief and whistleblower, Peter Zetko, will testify before the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on September 13 to discuss allegations of widespread security failures and foreign state actor interference at Twitter. Ireland's Data Protection Commission and France's CNIL data regulator both confirmed that they were investigating Zetko's allegations as well. Sony will increase the price of the PlayStation 5 between 6 to 21% in select markets across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America, and Canada, basically any place that's not the U.S. They don't plan to increase prices here. Sony cited high global inflation rates for the move. On NVIDIA's earnings call, CEO Jensen Huang hinted that the company would reveal its next-gen GPU architecture, Lovelace, at its GPU technology conference next month. On the call, Huang also said that NVIDIA had excess GPU inventory due to a fall in PC sales and is working with distributors to price position current stock to sell through it. Ooh. Bloomberg sources say Meta is spending a bunch of time on building out customer service, specifically around giving users support when accounts or posts are removed. This move is in part due to feedback from its oversight board, which last year reported it received almost a million user appeals about Meta's content moderation. In other Meta content news, Instagram updated its settings to now default new users under 16 years old to the app's most restrictive content settings and prompt existing teams to do the same. In June, Instagram introduced settings around sensitive content, letting users opt to see more, less, or standard amounts of this content. Those under 18 were able to choose either standard or less at launch, and now those under 16 will be just defaulted to less. The nutrition and weight loss app MyFitnessPal, you may use it, uh, will make its popular barcode scanning feature a premium paid feature. The feature was available to free accounts with ads, letting users scan food to log and track calories type thing. Existing free users can now use the feature until October 1st, and users creating free accounts after September 1st won't have access. Premium plans cost uh, $20 per month or $80 annually. I know. Well, my, you know, my, fit, my fitness you want to lose a lot of weight, friends. you're going to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because uh, people take their health very seriously, much like Amazon, Sarah. That's yep, called yep. A- it's yep. called Amazon a- does that also. Not when you call it out, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> like all the pros do. Amazon has been making a lot of waves in the healthcare space as of late. Uh, it's been scaling back, though, some of these uh, previous plans. Uh, that's at least according uh, to what we've been seeing in the news today. Uh, with, them infl- uh, with Amazon informing employees, it will shut down its virtual health service, Amazon Care, at the end of the year. The service initially rolled out to Amazon employees in 2019, made a bunch of waves at the time, and it offered virtual health services that paired with the option for in-home vers- uh, visits from registered nurses. Yeah, so if, you, if you've been following the story, it's not like Amazon's service was treading water and forgotten by the company. It expanded to all companies in Washington state in March of 2021. Then in February of this year, Amazon announced a national wide rollout. Plan to make it available in 20 U.S. cities throughout 2022. Began offering in-person care in eight cities, including Seattle and also Los Angeles. 
Yeah, and while this is, it seems like a significant uh, rollback, this isn't exactly Amazon getting out of the healthcare field, far from it. Uh, it still runs Amazon Amazon Pharmacy, which is based on its acquisition of PillPack that it completed in 2018. And in July, it announced plans to acquire the primary care provider, One Medical. That's still pending some regulatory approvals, but it seems like that is at least on the path to go forward. And earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal reported that Amazon was interested in acquiring the home health services provider Signify Health, although that's far from a done deal. It sounds like there are multiple companies vying for that as well, but they are interested, and that would be around an $8 billion deal. Yeah, no kidding. So you say, okay, sounds like Amazon is really interested in healthcare. So if healthcare is a clear focus for the company, why would Amazon shut down Amazon Care? Well, according to his SVP of health service, Neil Lindsay, wasn't just a compelling offer to big business, telling employees, quote, it is not a complete enough offering for the large enterprise cu customers that we have been targeting, end quote, which means... Absolutely nothing to me. <laughs> I mean, well, but uh, I don't know, Justin, you know, hearing all this stuff, do you, what are your thoughts? Among the most entrenched, protected and regulated industries in the United States of America is healthcare. You've got hospital networks, pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies, all of which make a lot of money in this, all of which want to protect their ability to do it. Getting into this field is incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. So with Amazon, you would think, oh, they have all the money in the world. Expensive doesn't matter. Well, Amazon is also a company for which that got rich by selling uh, $11, uh, uh, 18 <laughs> packs of paper towels for uh, $11 and one cents. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they mm -hmm. are, they are understanding of the bottom line and, I would say that this is just as much of a play to understand how they're going to solve the problem and less of a situation where they ran into a wall. Uh, uh, they're, they're figuring this out as they go. It's not a natural strength for them. And yet they understand that with their war chest and the fact that people rely on Amazon and look at it as a reliable brand, this is a natural field that they can move into if they do it right. Well, and to your point, Justin, this isn't even their first attempt to figure out the enterprise with this kind of solution. Not a lot of people remember it now, but in 2018, Amazon Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan Chase uh, made a big, big news that you know kind of was shaking up, uh, you know, the the healthcare field when they announced a joint venture called Haven that was going to see all of them working together to kind of figure out a similar kind of system to Amazon Care, like how to innovate with offering. Uh, healthcare services to employees, you know, combined those three companies have like over 2 million uh, uh, employees, you know, so like, so like, ma like three massive enterprises were going to try to figure out how to improve enterprise healthcare. And they called that quits in early 2021. I think right at the start of the year, they announced that that was all shutting down, kind of as they were starting to ramp up the rollout of Amazon care. So I, I you know, I think, Justin, I think that actually proves your point in that, this is something where there are so many entrenched interests. There are so many yes. different considerations that it's like, this is not something th they need to study this from multiple different angles. The weird thing with that statement from Lindsay though, is that it wasn't able to like create something for a large enterprise customer. A Amazon is like the largest, one of the largest enterprise customers. I mean, like if, if they can't figure that out with dog but fooding it on themselves to make it a compelling offering, that to me is like tells me, is it even possible for them to do that? And and they're they're going to keep trying. But part of that is the regulations. You know, even for telehealth, you have to be in the same physical area to get your telehealth professional to talk to you or you have to lie and say that you're in the <laughs> area that you're in. Uh, uh, they, there are rules to this. Uh, uh, and and I would say that they probably are archaic. At this point, there's no reason why I can't. If I have a telehealth physician for which I like, I, I should be able to contact them wherever I am in the world, just like I can a therapist or an accountant or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, th there's a reason why when they're because they're they're looking to sell this to gigantic businesses, businesses that have employees in many states and many countries. If you can't create a one size fits all offering for that, then it is a problem. 
So, Justin, if anyone's uh, listening to this saying, uh, well, I'm outside the U.S., what is going, like, why would telehealth have anything to do with where you are physically? Like, I mean, what what is the answer there? We have rules in America, uh, and I don't know what the rules are outside of America, but that you, even telehealth is an extension of your physical relationship with your healthcare provider. Yeah. Be that a primary care physician. I, I or think that might be yeah, new, new information for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, when we were, yeah, when we were in, um, in, in Europe recently, my, my wife took a wrong step down a, uh, a, 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 a train station, uh, twisted her knee. And I was like, Oh, well, why don't you talk to your telehealth person? And she's like, Oh no, I can't. I have to wait until I get back or I have to lie and just tell a bunch of Germans to start doing oh, their best American accent. she accents. was too far away. Too far away. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The, with, with Amazon here, it seems like they've moved, you know, it's always, when you want to build a new feature, it's always a classic, do we buy or build? And they've tried build twice. And now it definitely seems like, you know, because, uh, 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 one medical is offering almost the same service. They don't offer the nurses coming to your home. You go to a, you know, you go to a doctor after the telehealth visit, but it's very much the same service and it's solved. They have the infrastructure already in place on the ground in the areas that they operate in, Justin. So they're, they're solving a lot of the problems that they were probably running into uh, with, with Amazon care by buying into that. We'll see if they run into regulatory scrutiny, if they continue to make acquisitions though uh, in that area, for sure. All right. Well, uh, in these increasingly partisan times, finally, we have an issue both parties can rally behind paying news organizations. Turns out <laughs> a bipartisan group of senators and can members they? of Congress. <laughs> well, we will, we will see. Try. Listen, they We're put their try. names on a piece of paper. That's something. Yeah. <laughs> a bipartisan group of senators and members of Congress introduced a new version of the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act designed to remove legal obstacles to news organizations' ability to negotiate collectively and secure fair terms from gatekeeper platforms that regularly access news content without paying for its value. Uh, they're, they're all for slogans here with this legislation. This comes after a prior version of the bill stalled out last year. This revised version would allow publishers with fewer than 1,500 full-time employees to collectively negotiate with large platforms over access to news content, with publishers able to demand arbitration if talks stall out after six months. This would apply to platforms with over 50 million U.S. users that have at least a billion monthly active users globally or a market cap of over 550 billion. So what we're talking about here is not other media out outfits, but rather the tech platforms that often access this. So that would mean that this law would apply to Google and Meta, but not Twitter. Google and Meta have offered payments to publishers in the past, uh, but generally only through patchworks of partnerships. Google has done this most recently through its news showcase program, reaching agreements with publishers in Canada, France, the UK, Japan, India, many other countries. Those are some of the big ones. Meta has made deals with publishers in several countries to pay for content in its news tab. Although after its recent revenue dip uh, in its earnings for the first time, it reportedly told US publishers it would stop paying for news content to run there. Meanwhile, Australia's parliament passed the News Media Bargaining Code last year that required platforms like Meta and Google to pay for use of news content. You know, uh, Justin, this seems to be, you know, we, we, we covered a lot of the updates uh, when everything was going down and, and you know, Facebook and Google were playing their, their brinksmanship uh, in Australia over this. I'm curious, do you think this legislation has legs this time and will this have any impact on uh, the news industry in the U.S.? Well, this certainly has uh, uh, some dueling flavors in terms of the issues that various parties like to talk about. On one hand, Republicans are not going to be on the side of the lamestream media finding another revenue source. But also, if it means that the, the, the big tech monopoly state, as they are wont to call it, can have another reason to pay out, then maybe they could be assuaged to do it. What's funny about this particular situation is, as you mentioned, uh, uh, with, with Meta already pulling back on paying U.S. publishers, considering that the ad markets for both of these companies are not what they were five years ago, you have to wonder exactly what the fair market price would be going forward. And while certainly any kind of media enterprise, which has also experienced the downshift in display advertising, is going to be thirsting for another uh, revenue model, 
I, I don't quite know what material benefit to the bottom line it would have. I mean, certainly the like I, I was thinking about this in terms of uh, the the value, right? Like, what? Okay, so like the the question is like, why is why is this building being floated out here in the first place? And I, I think even if you know there, there there is certainly on the right you know uh, uh, questions about the the utility of as you said the lamestream media that some form of media right is like good right like i i think this I think is so. uh, yes. yes and so and so this is a, this is a way for 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 congress to say okay if we pass this we don't have to uh, do any kind of public we don't have to expand public funding we don't have to raise a tax we can go after not go after we can use the the money that big tech firms are placking, getting in monetizing this content already and give this back to the publishers. I guess my question is like the alternative seems to be we do some other tax and then we 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 I, I don't I don't, I don't know why I don't know like, why you're going there as 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 a binary to this. I mean certainly No no, no I'm sorry. To... I don't I don't mean to position it as such. I I, I yeah. guess my my question is uh is like if this doesn't happen, what like what is the what is the course of action? I guess for for publishers, is it just cutting it's, individual deals the with these thing. platforms without trans yeah. like it, yeah no it, it's the exact same thing that's happening now right mm -hmm. like like this would be the government mandating that these larger tech platforms have to play ball with these guys, and if they don't agree with the terms, then they're gonna have to agree with the mandatory arbitration. So this is creating a protected preferential agreement for these smaller publishers because the big tech companies have so much money and so much influence and so much reach and so many eyeballs that they are unfairly uh, uh, represented in these situations. So uh, uh, if this doesn't happen, then we're basically where we are right now, where they are the 800 pound gorilla. However, uh, you know, whether or not Google and Meta will want to be more friendly with these companies is a different story, especially as they might find themselves in a situation where they do want more reasons for people to stay on their platform because, you know, Facebook just reported that people left their platform for the first time a few months ago. Well, you probably have thoughts about this. And if you do, you can join the conversation in our Discord by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's talk about expensive speakers, shall we? <laughs> the Verge's sources say that Sonos began work on a completely new high-end speaker called the Optimo 2. Roughly the size of the Sonos 5 speaker, if you're familiar with the Sonos line, featuring drivers around the device for immersive Dolby Atmos audio and mics to fine-tune audio within a room. It'll support playback over Wi-Fi and also Bluetooth, as well as uh, possibly USB-C line-in. I would be interested in that. Sonos also began work on the Optimo 1 and 1SL to act as smaller satellite speakers with the Optimo 2. Again, this is these are rumors, but it's 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 uh this is what the Verge is saying. Yeah, the Verge seems to have some good sources when it comes to Sonos leaks and they say they've uh viewed some early work in progress images of the Optimo 2, which is an evolution in design compared to Sonos's existing products, thinking like the Sonos 1, the 5 arc beam and roam the verge describes it as encased in a funky dual angled shell the new device will be positioned as the best sounding speaker that sonos has ever produced according to uh people the verge uh say are familiar with the products optimo 2 includes twice as much ram and as much as eight times as much flash memory as any previous sonos speaker uh calling it a powerhouse clearly designed to kind of have a long road of software support and kind of potentially having you know feature add or or continue to be relevant in the ecosystem for a long time yeah, from 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 what we've gleaned here, what Sonos is hoping for is that the Optimo 2 will do what former speakers have not been able to do, support music playback over Wi-Fi, but also Bluetooth audio. So far, Bluetooth playback has been limited to portable hardware like the Move and the Roam. So Sonos is also considering USB-C line-in playback for the device, which would make it the only Sonos speaker aside from the 5 to offer those capabilities. I am a Sonos person. I've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five Sonos speakers that are active in my home right now. Um, 
there are good things and bad things about, you know, the Sonos ecosystem. I use it with Amazon's ecosystem to, you know, to, you know, for voice controlled things. The, the sound is unparalleled. It's great. You could also say that about the HomePod, you know, Apple says, yeah. oh, it's great. You know, I mean, it's, it's the best thing you can buy and it's, you know, really expensive for that reason. How many did they sell? Mm, not that many, you know, not, not, not compared to, to, to hi-fi levels of sales. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the tens of people that uh, will be excited for this. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to be the 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 anti audiophile guy because I I know that that is a space with a lot of passion and I know that that there are like if you want to go in on your hi fi setup it's going to sound spectacular to you but I think in the when you get into the consumer electronics space I always think about Bose right like Bose was like this this market like they they had commercials that told me they had waves that would make everything sound amazing and audio files would tell you it was terrible but you spent five hundred dollars on your radio so it sounded a lot better like well, so on a this was also like ahead of the game when it came to like noise canceling i mean yeah. noise canceling like lots of companies can do that but, but Bose kind of championed that at in the early days well and but, and, and, and they made they made their bones on the idea of selling to audiophiles or rather people that would have like to think of themselves as yes. audiophiles the audiophiles themselves right. uh, uh as as rich mentioned were were uh, you know very anti anti bose and i will never i will never slander the audiophiles because by definition they're always listening very yeah, if, if, <laughs> if you do they're gonna come back for you oh it's they whatever. always ears are wide open on those uh -huh. chuckleheads mm -hmm. but my 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 point is that like you can say you have the best sounding speaker and that's very easy to do because anyone says it. Apple said it when they came out with the HomePod. They said, you know, they were using all these mics to, to beamform everything and make it sound substantially better. It's very easy to say you have the best audio sound. And unless you are like dealing with you are an audiophile where you have attuned your ear to like very specifically like listen to that. There is a certain threshold where if I paid a certain amount of money for a product and it sounds pretty good, I'm inclined to think it sounds very good. Right. So it's like so my yeah. I, my point is my yeah. point is a lot of like the reason uh like I, I feel like Sonos is going to have a hard time marketing this as opposed to a lot of their more mid market offerings that they've really been pushing in the market. Supposedly had their sub mini that's been delayed now uh, for into next year. But a lot of their stuff is a, a, like a little bit more of a, a, a general consumer price point as opposed to premium. And I think that's because Google, Apple, Amazon have all kind of figured out like we can say it all sounds really good. No one's comparing these sitting in a room other than the five reviewers at, you know, a couple tech blogs. And yeah. if you hear it and you spend a certain amount of money and it works really well with all of your ecosystem, that's way more valuable than like what the treble response is. No, you I, know, I, 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 I don't. I, I don't agree. And and I think that it's because we have a lot of speakers that say they sound good and then don't sound great that Sonos should return to what brought them to the dance. And that is higher end priced uh, uh, smart speakers that fairly seamlessly integrate via Wi-Fi. Uh, like Sarah, I have three of them in my house. I have been a Sonos uh, a devotee for a while now. And I would love another big flagship speaker. I would move my my other one somewhere else in the house and, and we would continue to build out gorgeous lush sound that would play <laughs> at the exact same time. Uh, Sarah, let me ask you this. Design wise, Sonos has always kind of had fairly clean design. The one thing that made me wince a little bit was. Uh, the the funky case dual I, angled I, shell. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't know what the hell that's supposed to mean. And and for a a company that has really made its reputation on very clean, very beautiful speakers, the idea of funky dual angled shells <laughs> is something funky, that made me like, wince a little bit. Yeah, funky shell. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean. If I if I could, as a very much not design, uh, you know, a, a person who should be speaking of this, um, but still, I will. Um, if Sonos is kind of like, well, okay, we made sort of like the like fun speakers that now all speakers look like now, 
and we were kind yep. of at the forefront of that. Let's kind of make and, things and a still, little different. And still look better than all of them, in my opinion. They still look better than all the other smart. Hundred percent, hundred percent, agree with you. But you know, the, if, if someone's like, "Well, I have a hundred dollars, not three hundred dollars, so I'm going to get this this uh, particular." Um, a uh, 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 speaker and it's going to sound like pretty good for my podcasts, you know, and I think that 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 counts for a lot. I think that Sonos is again, it is in that if you want to be kind of a diva about audio, Sonos is your jam. Um, and I sort of consider myself one of those people at the same time. How often am I really like pumping the jams to the point where I'm like, yeah, this is the best speaker ever, rather than some other speaker that I could have bought. Hmm. Google Home speaker, probably pretty good in that sense. So, you know, grain of salt. Although now, well, now, now that it'll have line in, uh, we're going to get turntables hooked up to Sony. <laughs> so be fun. And, and Everyone's then, brains will be and then we, let's circle back. Yeah. And talk about that. Cause yeah. I've got some vinyl upstairs. There we go. That I never use. <laughs> um, well, well, uh, let's, let's turn to travel for a second because many people are traveling recently and kind of wondering how do I travel, uh, you know, appropriately. Uh, Chris Christensen is our travel guru and says, if you're planning and communicating across time zones, it can be confusing for parties on both ends of the conversation. We've all been there. Thankfully, Chris has a few tips on straightening out the time zone confusion. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I had a frustrating week this week around time zones. I was trying to communicate with a recruiter. I kept sending them that it would be 9 a.m., PDT, Pacific Daylight Time, and they kept saying, yep, yep, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, PST. Those are two different time zones, and they're one hour apart. Now, no one right now that I know of is using PST, but if, however, she was talking about Mountain Standard Time versus Mountain Daylight Time, both of those are in use in the U.S. at the same time. Arizona never goes to Daylight Savings Time. If you're trying to communicate across time zones, two easy tricks. One is just set up in your calendar, send an invite for whatever time you mean, and let the calendar do the conversion for the person at the other end. Or if you want to know what time it is someplace, you can just Google it. You can say 9 a.m. PT to Paris, and it will tell you the time in Paris that corresponds to 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, how I know. How I know the plight. <laughs> how I know the plight of the time zone. <laughs> Even someone saying PST, I'm like, it's PDT. It just time leave, leave the middle initial out. Yep. Never. It's always a mistake. <laughs> it's, yep. it's Pacific time. It's mountain time. It's central time. It's Eastern time. I but, never you know, get it right. It, to Chris's point, it depends on where you live. Um, so yeah, good, good thing to remember. And thank you always uh, to Chris for giving us uh, good tips on how we can travel more smartly. All right, let's go on to the mailbag. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send emails. We got a couple emails today. Uh, let's start with Russell, who says, I've pointed out from time to time how things I learn listening to DTNS help me at work. That's awesome, Russell. Russell says, this happened today. I was in a meeting with a client discussing adding EV charging stations to one of their facilities. Based on the discussion on yesterday's show, I had learned that there are actually right to charge states, and I was able to use this fact in the meeting, which was helpful to the client. And this is exactly why the hive mind works. Thank you so much, Russell. Uh, that that's awesome. Yeah, and then and in the same vein, Sam wrote in uh, in response with uh, right to charge uh, laws conversation, and he said listeners should be aware that some states also have rights to solar laws. So a homeowners association can't stop you from putting up solar panels on your house, even in Texas. Oh gosh, even in Texas. That's what he said. Uh, in Texas, <laughs> even in Texas, <laughs> even in Texas. Speaking of Texas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Justin Robert Young, I don't know how you feel about solar panels on your house in Texas, but I know that you care about a lot of things, and uh, our show being one of them, but many other uh, many other things. So let folks know where they can keep up with your work. 
I know that well-meaning but irritating 20-somethings come to my door about three times a week to try to sell me solar panels. So I guess they're, uh, oh. they're, they're, they're popular <laughs> okay. somewhere. Did you know that you can get them effectively free? No. What? I'm going to ask you to leave. I'm going to ask you to leave my house. Okay. Uh, uh, but what I want you, the dear listener, to do is give my podcast, We're Not Wrong, a chance. That is the panel program with myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton. This week, we discussed the expectations that you have for leadership in the wake of the Finnish prime minister scandal where she was caught dancing and singing drunk on mm -hmm. Twitter and uh, the future. Allegedly. Allegedly. I think she said she was drunk. She said oh, okay. she was not on drugs uh, and then mm -hmm. took a drug test to prove it. Although we don't know when that video was taken. And I force everybody else in the panel to say if she was on drugs, Name what drugs you think she's on. <laughs> Listen to those I answers mean, I, on I could... We're Not Wrong right now. Available now. Yeah. <laughs> I had some ideas, but I will save it for your Let's, show. Yeah, we can. We can. Not not the time or place, but uh, uh, I'll DM you. <laughs> the time or place to thank patrons is now. Thank you to our brand new bosses, Flash and Shane. Flash and Shane just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you so much. We love new patrons. We Woo -woo. thank you. We welcome you. And speaking of patrons, if you want to stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, we're going to do that right after we wrap up here. But just a reminder, you can catch the show Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live if you want to tell a friend. That would be great. We'll be back tomorrow talking the current state of GPU availability and prices with Patrick Norton and Len Peralta on our stuff. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>